Jesus, Jesus, there's just something about that name, Master, Savior, Jesus, like the fragrance after the rain, Jesus, 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 let all heaven and earth proclaim, kings and kingdoms shall all pass away, but there's something like to welcome you to our worship service on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. Amen. I don't think you can find a more perfect day than what we are experiencing. And uh, my family, some of my family lives in North Dakota. And last week on Easter Sunday, they had 30 inches of snow and 15 degrees. And they're under a blizzard warning today for another foot. So I think the church here should say a great big amen, right? So we're very grateful for the Lord's blessings in our lives and in this place. And we're still celebrating Easter, you know that, right? Easter's not just a day, it's a season, and it continues right on into Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church. So we're here to just worship God and to give God all the glory that is due his holy name. So we want to begin our service today by prayer. And uh, I'm going to ask Landon to sing that little chorus, A Wall of Prayer, because a couple of weeks ago, uh, someone had come in and they were discouraged and needing some guidance from the Lord. And it was told to him outside that he needed a wall of prayer around him. And then he came to worship and I asked Landon to sing that song, and that was an affirmation. And I think we all need that wall of prayer around us. So take just a moment, let's pray together, and then I'm going to ask him to sing that for us. Father, we thank you for this day and for the goodness and blessings of it. We thank you for those who have gathered in this place. Help us to do nothing more and nothing less than to praise and worship you. For, Lord, that's why we have come. For the Bible says that you um, seek those who worship you in spirit and in truth, and that you do inhabit praise. So we praise your holy name today and give you glory. And let everybody say, Amen. Oh, my brother, when I'm weak, would you stand instead for me? Pray a fortress round me strong that can't be moved. And I promise you today, when I bow my knees to pray, I'll do my best to build a wall of prayer.
right, I think we're going to begin now as a congregation by singing an old hymn, and I believe Jimmy's got the words on the screen for us. Heaven's Jubilee. And um, if you'd like to stand up, you can. You're more than welcome to sit. But put your hands together, clap, sing, do what you want to, to praise the Lord as we sing together. Some glad morning we shall see Jesus in the air Coming after you and me, joy is ours to share What rejoicing there will be when the sun shall rise Headed for the jubilee, yonder in the skies Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting On that happy morning when we all shall rise Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. Seems that now I almost see all the sainted dead, rising for the jubilee that is just ahead. In the twinkling of an eye, change with them to be. All the living saints who fly to the jubilee. Singing, oh, what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the skies. When with all that heavenly host we begin to sing, singing in the Holy Ghost, how the heavens will ring. Song, with them we shall be praising Christ for ages long, heaven's jubilee. Oh, what singing, oh, what shouting on that happy morning when we all shall rise. Oh, what glory, hallelujah, when we meet our blessed Savior in the sky. You can be seated, those of you who aren't standing, and uh, let's just praise the Lord in some music and worship right now as Landon and Tim share with us, okay? I can't deny I'm terrified of the shadows before me. in my story my broken heart is filled with pain I just can't undo but anything that Jesus leads me to I know that he'll lead me that he'll lead me through Sometimes we cry and deeply grieve in the pain and the loss The journey here but sometimes feel like a heavy, heavy cross. But even still, His word remains. And I promise you that anything that Jesus leads me to, I know that He'll lead you through. still true and 
Anything that Jesus leads me to, I know that He'll lead me through. leads me to I know that he'll lead me through I never said that I would give you silver or gold or you would never feel the fire and shiver in the cold but I did say you'd never walk through this world alone. And I did say, don't make this world your home. I never said that fear wouldn't find you in the night. Or that loneliness was something you'd never have to fight. But I did say I'd be right there by your side. I'll always help you fight. You know I made a promise. sufficient in every time of need. My love will be the anchor that you can hold on to. This is the promise. This is the promise I've made to you. I never said that friends wouldn't turn their back on you. Or that the world around you wouldn't see you as a fool. But I did say, like me, you'll surely be despised. And I did say, I ways confound the wise. I didn't say you'd never taste the bitter kiss of death Or have to walk through chilly Jordan to enter into rest But I did say I'd be waiting right on the other side And I did say I'll dry every tear you cry Sooner than you think, you'll see me face to face, and you'll sing with the angels and the countless multitude. This is the promise, this is the promise I've made to you. Aren't you so thankful this morning for all of God's promises? I'm glad that he's faithful to fulfill every promise that he's ever made. Amen. So just keep on walking. Don't turn to the left or right. And in the midst of darkness, let this be your light. That hell can separate us and you're gonna make it through. This is the promise I've made to you. Oh, this is the promise. This is the promise I've made to you.
was exciting, wasn't it? That's what Easter is all about. God's promise, the resurrection, never to leave us alone, never to forsake us. I've already told you that we continue Easter, and my reading for today is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 31. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, that's the first Easter that we celebrated last Sunday, remember, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anybody's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, can anybody tell me from last year's sermons what the word Didymus means? Anybody remember that? Didymus, Didymus means the twin, okay? So Thomas, known as the twin, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, we've seen the Lord. Kind of like you ever been uh, around children who are playing and maybe somebody missed out on something and the others say, nah, 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 you missed it. Does that happen? Does that still happen with the kids? <laughs> and the other disciples said, wow, you missed it. You weren't here when it happened. And he said, and this is where he gets that title, although I think is undeserved, the title Doubting Thomas. I would like to think that he was believing Thomas because he wanted the evidence, you know. And the Bible tells us not to believe every wind of doctrine that blows along. So he was just wanting to make sure for himself. And so he said, unless I can see the nail prints in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe now, a week later, that would be this weekend, a week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them this time. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand, and put it in my side, stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. And then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus performed many other miracles and signs in the presence of his disciples that are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So we just have little glimpses into the life of Jesus from the time it was prophesied of his birth and when he was born in Bethlehem of Judea. And then as he went as a small child into Egyptian exile for safety and then returned back to Nazareth to his hometown where he grew up. We only find little bits and pieces of his young life. The first thing we really see about him is when he's 12 years old, if you remember, he goes to the Passover feast in Jerusalem with his parents, Joseph and Mary. And by the way, that is the last account that I can remember reading about Joseph. Joseph apparently passed away during the time that Jesus was 13 to 30 or so. 
because he, his uh, earthly father, Joseph, is never mentioned again. After that, at the age of 12, he got separated from his parents. Do you all remember that story? And they went looking for him, and they chastised him just a little bit, but they were so glad to find him, and they found him in the temple. And I often tell people, if you feel like you're missing out on Jesus, a good place to begin is looking in the church. And I believe that where two or more gather in the name of the Lord, you'll find Jesus. Now, church, when I say that, doesn't necessarily mean brick and mortar and wooden timbers and cement floors. The church of Jesus Christ, as I have told you many times, is each one of us that are seated here right now. Me, you, all of us here, and those gathering wherever you are by means of social media, whether it be Facebook or YouTube. You are the church. We are the church. And where two or three of us gather together in the name of the Lord, good things can happen. Miracles can take place. Blessings flow. Do you believe that? Say amen. And so uh, you'll always find Jesus. There's an old song that we used to sing, and, and someday we're going to stump land, and we're going to name something that he doesn't know. Have you, I bet you've heard that one too. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus. Have you ever heard that one? I bet you have. Once I sing it, he'll start playing it. But it, it says, standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him, and you'll know him by the nail prints in his hand, right? Okay, so in case you don't know, I bet you've heard it, so I'm going to try it. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you'll find Jesus, and you'll know him by the nail prints in his hand. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. He's the only one that truly understands. Have you heard it now? You haven't? Well, I think he did pretty good to just pick up on it, didn't you? Standing somewhere, sing it with me. In the shadows, you'll find Jesus. He's the only one who cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows, you will find him. And you'll know him by the nail prints in his hand. Well, I kind of reversed it around, but it rhymes. And any way you sing it, it's true. And often in the shadows, when we least expect him and need him most, he will appear. And that's what the text is about today that I have read on this second weekend of Easter. You know, the disciples, at least 10 of them, were gathered in the upper room. Remember, Judas is no longer with them, having betrayed the Lord and gone out and hanged himself. So Judas brought the crowd down to 11, and then we discover that Thomas was missing on that first gathering as they were there behind closed doors. And the scripture says that they were there because of their fear of the Jewish leaders. And so they were fearful, they were afraid, and they were behind locked doors. You remember that old country song, and it has nothing to do with my sermon, except we've all heard it. It says, no one knows what goes on behind closed doors. Remember that? Uh, well, they were hiding for fear that they themselves might be the ones who are taken next and crucified. You see, Jesus had been numbered with the transgressors, and he was hanged between two transgressors, two thieves, Two male factors, the Bible says. And crucifixion was the way that people were put to death by execution in those days of Roman rule in the Middle East and most of the Roman world. And it was done so publicly 
in humiliation for all to see. And so the disciples realized if they've already taken Jesus, then I might be the next one on the list. And so they were hiding for fear of their lives. And I think that fear is a terrible thing. The Bible says that perfect love will cast out fear. And the Bible also says, do not fear what man can do to you, right? But fear the Lord with a holy and awesome fear and respect. Trust the Lord. Love the Lord with all your heart. So we believe as Christians, as people of faith, I think that would speak for all who named the name of Jesus, that he came to this earth to deliver a message from God that is so true that it applies to every one of us at all times and is relevant to all people. Everybody say all. All people. It is for us, for all people, an eternal message. And what this message from the Lord Jesus is, simply put, and I've told you this over and over again, God loves us. God is love. They had so many uh, commandments in the Old Testament. They began, out, began with what I call the Big Ten. And we have those posted in lots of places. And some of those have to do with our relationship to God. And some of those have to do with our relationship to others around us. And so then, as Jesus came along, the people over the centuries and even millenniums of time had added to the laws, you know. It's like I saw a sign that says, what part of thou shalt do you not understand? But yet, so many people try to add to all of that and complicate it and use a term we use in the New, New Testament, frustrate the grace of the Lord. Grace is a free gift. It's simple. It's so simple that anyone could understand it. But sometimes the religious people want to add on and put our own interpretation to it and try to decide that it's going to be my way or the highway. But when they tried to trick Jesus into the idea of who is my neighbor, he simply said, look around you and anybody that you see that is your neighbor. And he said, on, on all the laws that have ever been uh, given by God or commanded by the Lord, there are two that now are relevant. Jesus came to fulfill the other scriptures, not to destroy them, but to fulfill them, right? But he said these two can be summarized, everything else in this. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love other people. And we used to sing a little song years ago when I served in an inner city church in Miami. It was, I still remember those days fondly. But we had a call to worship for so long that said people need the Lord. People need the Lord at the end of broken dreams. There's an open door. People need the Lord. Jesus came to love people and he came to teach us that God does not want to punish people, but to have people to be reconciled with God. God didn't come to cast us aside. He came looking for the one sheep that had lost its way. The one little sheep that had wandered off into dangerous territory. And the Bible says the good shepherd will leave the 99 safe in the fold and go out and search until he finds that one who has been lost and separated from the rest of the crowd, okay? So it talks about community. God wants us to be in community together as the people of faith. Not everybody doing our own little thing off in every little corner of the world, but that we all find a place where God is working and then just jump in with all of our effort and do what God is calling us to do, right? Isn't that how it works? So God doesn't want to punish us, but to reconcile us. 
Reconcile means bring back together, bring people home again. God does not want to hurt people, but to heal them. Back in the prophecy of Jesus, uh, they call it the passage of the suffering servant. It's about where um, Isaiah sees this hundreds of years before it ever happened, and it says he was despised and rejected of men. Um, and it goes on to say that by his stripes we are healed. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. Jesus did all of that. And Jesus came that we might find healing. Landon sometimes sing that song, I claim the blood. I claim the blood that Jesus shed on Calvary. And God does not desire to pass judgment on people, but to give people grace. The grace of God that is greater than all the sins of the world. Can the church say amen? Grace, grace, God's grace. Grace that is greater than all our sin. So we want to think back to the early Christian community that I've been discussing here. We imagine them, as we read the book of Acts about Christianity, that they were all together. Now this was down the road after the first day of resurrection. Sometime, some years later, you know, we see the church together with one mind and one heart and helping one another and giving to one another and sharing with one another. As the Bible says, 3,000 were added in one day and 5,000 were added in another day, and God added to the church daily those who were being saved. But that's not true in what we see here at the moment. That was not true on this first Easter season. The Christians, this was the beginnings of the church. These 10 people and others who are not named, who were followers of Jesus, but remember I told you Judas was already gone. They had not yet named another disciple. And then um, Thomas had not been present that first time. They weren't doing the work of the church. And there comes times that you and I fail in working for the kingdom of God. The Bible says, look upon the fields, for they are white unto harvest. And Jesus said, the laborers are few. And so he tells us that we are to pray. We, we don't need to expect somebody else to pray. Can the church say amen today? Um, it's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. You hear me say that an awful lot at Shades of Grace, but it is so true, right? But Jesus said, you pray that the Lord will send people into the fields. And if we are listening to the call of the Lord, we will hear the Lord speak our name. And we will be doing what we can to share the faith, to let our little light shine, and to bring glory to the Lord. So um, the disciples were fearful, and there are times that you and I are fearful. I told you a while ago that fearful fear is a terrible thing. But God wants, the Bible says God has not given us the spirit of fear. If you have a spirit of fear today, that is not God's plan. We all become fearful, but we don't live by fear. We live by faith of Jesus Christ and what he has promised us to do. And so that love of God, that pure love of God cast out the fear. How many Andy Griffith fans do we have in the house today. About a third of us or a fourth of us. But I guess I've watched all those episodes until I know what they're gonna say. You know, I can almost just be listening to it and know how they're gonna answer. But there's one, one time, and I don't go into all the details, but Andy was telling Barney that, Barney, there's nothing to be afraid of except, you got it, fear itself. Right? You remember that one? And old Barney's shaking and jerking and 
going all over. And he says, well, Andy, that, that's my problem. That's just what I got, a good case of fear itself. And maybe you're like that today, listening to these words. There may be something in your life that you're fearful about. You know, uh, it could be anything. But my words, my advice to each of us is to trust the Lord, trust in Jesus Christ, and not only trust in Him, but trust Him. For He's not a figment of imagination. He's not someone who just existed 2,000 years ago and then died on a cross, but He is a living and loving God who sits at the right hand of the Father, and He knows your name. He knows my name. He knows everything about us, right? And He's making intercession for us. Do you know what that means? He's got your back. He's got you covered. He's praying for you. And how can it go wrong if Jesus is praying for us? Amen. How could it ever turn out wrong if Jesus is praying for us? And that's the promise I want you to hang on to today as we continue the promises of Easter is that if God be for us, who in the world could ever be against us? And so even though they were filled with fear on that first Easter and even the following week, Jesus appeared both times when, when uh, Thomas was present and even the week before when Thomas was not present. And he gave them the very same message. Do you remember what the message is that I read a few minutes ago on both occasions? You remember that? Peace be unto you. Peace to you. That's why for many centuries when Christians gather together, even one-on-one, -on -one, it's a good idea to simply say, peace be with you. Give a fist bump. Peace be with you. Look at your neighbor today and just say, peace be with you. You know, that's a great gift that you can give to someone. Offer them peace in the name of Jesus Christ. In a world that is so filled with tragedy and turmoil and pain and fear, offer peace. Because Jesus said there is a peace that I give you that the world cannot even understand. It's not the kind of peace that the world even knows anything about. In our world, we make peace treaties today and break them tomorrow. We don't always live up to our word, but Jesus Christ lives up to his word. He says, come to me, every one of you. See, there we have it again, everybody. We don't leave anybody behind, right? We don't leave anybody out. The kingdom of God belongs to all people. We're created in his image and likeness, and we simply say, Lord, here I am. Help me to be a better example of what your kingdom living is all about. Some days it's, it gets very hard. It becomes very tiresome. We become very weary. And I always try to be in an attitude of prayer, and sometimes I miss it. Can anybody else say I miss it from time to time? But the Holy Spirit always kind of hits us in the heart and says, you didn't quite get it that time, but you're going to do better the next time. But my prayer and my ambition and my goal is that everybody I meet, not only at those doors, but if I'm going to the grocery store or if I'm walking along the road for my six or seven mile walk that I do every day of the world, wherever I am, that people, doesn't, people don't necessarily see me, but they see a representative of Jesus, right? I, I don't want people to see me. I want people to see Jesus. And that's what sanctification is all about. And we need to understand that, that we release a little bit more of our faith into the hands of the Lord and shed off just a little bit more of 
our old ways, old habits, old things that tend to pull us down and hang us up. So on those two occasions, Jesus said, Peace be unto you. Peace be with you. And then he showed them his amazing grace by these words, by doing this. He did not chastise them and say, boy, what a bunch of sorry disciples you are. Have you ever felt like you really failed the test and was, were just a sorry ambassador for Jesus? You ever done that? I've done it, people. I'm not proud of it, but I'm human, and I'll do it again. That's why you should never look at me as your example. And everybody ought to be saying the same thing, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Jesus is our guideline. He is the one that we look to. So Jesus did not chastise them or even hint a bit of disappointment in them. He already knew. He understood. He didn't condemn them for their weakness and for their failure to stand up for him. Right? He came not into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. That's the verse after John 3.16. You know, we all can quote John 3.16. That's very famous. Most everybody can. But we don't always add verse 17, which talks about no condemnation. God did not give any of us the position to condemn or judge. And he didn't shame them for being cowards. He didn't say, how in the world can you do this? After all I've done for you, you know, he had done so much for them. And yet they fell far short. And this is after they'd seen him walk on the water and feed the multitudes and even raise Lazarus from the dead and all the other things that he did. But he didn't shame them. And he didn't ask them, why in the world are you hiding behind these locked doors? He already knew. You know, there's something to the effect that I've heard Steve mention and a mutual friend in a church who always said, you know, here we are as somebody who believes in Jesus and he already knows everything about us and what we need. And we're the ones spending all of our time talking to him and explaining to him as if he doesn't know. He already knows. He knows the end from the beginning. He knows what you're going to do this evening before you even do it. Right? God is omnipotent. God did not condemn them or even ask them why. Are you hiding? He understood they were afraid. And you know what? He didn't say anything about their fear. He didn't say anything about it. He knew they were afraid. He simply says, peace be with you. Miss D, peace be with you. Do it again. Is that how you say unto you? Okay, let's say peace. Peace be unto you. Do that again. Everybody do it. Watch Miss D. Now this is how you can do. And when you want to speak American Sign Language to anybody, you could say peace be unto you. Be unto you. All right. You know, in the church often, in the more liturgical churches, and we're definitely not liturgical at Shades of Grace. I mean, we, we don't go through all the bells and whistles and, and all the things that what I call high church, but uh, that's all good and wonderful in its place. And I certainly appreciate all the work of the people and the work of God in the people of God. But, you know, often in the more um, formal type settings, uh, the pastor will greet the people and say, uh, peace be with you. And the congregation will say back, and also with you. Right? Y'all have done that. Peace be with you, and also with you. And one day the pastor was up there, and 
they were having trouble with the microphone and it wasn't coming through. He said, he stood up and he said, this microphone is, is crazy, it's lost its mind. And they said, and also with you. <laughs> anyway, make sure you know what you're blessing. <laughs> Uh, listen long enough to the conversation that you don't agree with just everything, right? But practice, practice it, okay? All right, are y'all glad you came to church today? Are you glad that Jesus loves you? Are you glad that Jesus is still in the forgiving business? And he didn't come to hurt you, but he came to help you. That's the good news of the gospel of Jesus. And Jesus said, all authority has been given to you now to proclaim the kingdom of God. And whenever we love one another as Christ has loved us, and when we learn how to forgive one another as Christ forgives, then we can honestly pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Okay, friends, it's been so good to see you today in worship. We appreciate you for being here. Landon, I want you to find us something that we can all sing together, and I want, uh, we'll follow you. Far away in the depths of my spirit to the church say thank you Lord for the peace that passeth all understanding. I'm so glad that you all have come today to join us for this time of worship and I pray that you have a wonderful week. I want to just give you a little bit of an update as I wind it up just to share with you and those who are a part of our large online congregation on Sundays is we are doing a lot of work on the community campus on Gibson Mill Road. It was formerly the community UMC. It was given to us from the conference to be a secondary place of ministry for us to reach out in the Gibson town and Gibson Mill Road area. And we will be doing a whole lot of ministry there in the coming weeks and months. But one of the things that will be happening a week from tomorrow is we will have a Philippine-speaking congregation 
that will be there called Jesus is Lord Church. And Mikey, who's a part of Shades of Grace forever since we've been here, is a part of that congregation. And they're going to have the launching of the service a week from tomorrow. If you're viewing this on Sunday, it will be uh, this day, May 1st, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. 1 o'clock, I'm sorry. It's 1 o'clock. I apologize. It will be 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So you will be, you are invited to participate in that. That will be just one of the many uses for that building on Gibson Mill. But we're going to be having children's ministry, recovery. We'll be doing some of our worship services at Shades of Grace there to reach out in the community. So God is guiding us and we're taking it one step at a time as to how we will be led by the Lord into that. But it's a great opportunity. So uh, just, just wanted to give you an update on that. Also, our Nigerian ministry that we began about a year and a half ago is going really strong. And uh, has it been a year and a half or two years? How long has that been? That was, well, it's been about a year and a half, I guess. But we have um, a school there now, Shades of Grace School. We have about 180 students and eight teachers that we sponsor. And these are small children who are from uh, tragedies and war-torn situations. Many of them are orphans. Many of them have injuries from wars that have taken place where many of their families have been murdered. Uh, these are children who would not have any chance in the world. And God has blessed Shades of Grace right here in Kingsport to reach out on the other side of the world to be a light for the kingdom of God. And so we're just extremely grateful for that ministry. And then we've also been able to reach out to the Ukraine. And in the past uh, two months here at Shades of Grace, we have been able to give $6,000 to the Ukraine people and it, only God can do that through a small storefront congregation. But you see, we're taking care of people at home. We're doing what the scripture says, preach the gospel, live the gospel, demonstrate the gospel in, at home in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. So there's a whole lot happening. If you want to know more about it, see me and we'll be glad to... Uh, point you in that direction. We have a Facebook page for um, both of these things that I've talked about other than our regular page. So there's a whole lot happening and the only answer is but God. But God. And in God it happens. So I wanted you to, to know that. Uh, just celebrate all of that with us as we celebrate the faithfulness of God and the example that Jesus Christ gave us. So, um, Landon, can we sing one more chorus as we go? Yeah, yeah. see, he's always ready, yeah. Uh, whether we know it may be good or bad, but we'll know it. Okay, victory in Jesus. Precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. All my love is to Him. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. God bless you. Go in peace. And we'll see you, God willing, next Saturday morning at 1030 as we gather in-house for worship again. Bye.